Andy and Caroline and uh, Robert, uh, sorry, Richard, have been talking about some of these strange things that have happened in researching paranormal and other historical mysteries. I'm going to probably tell you one of the two of the strangest kind of weird things that have happened to me over the years when I've been doing my research. So I've got like half an hour to do it in. So there's, I could literally go on all day, but I'm going to pick one or two that have a little bit of relevance. As Andy has probably told you, it all started many years ago with this story of the green stone. Now this was basically the first quest that we ever went on. Um, before that we were investigating things like UFOs and ghosts and so forth and the paranormal. But this was the first historical quest and it concerned a stone, a green stone, that had once apparently belonged to Mary Queen of Scots and it had been hidden and a series of clues had been hidden after the gunpowder plot of uh, 1605 and it had a, 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 a person at the time, a persecuted Catholic in England, had left a series of clues as to where this stone was hidden and it was supposed to possess miraculous powers. Now, I won't go into the whole story of how we started solving the series of clues that were left as to where this was hidden. Basically, they were in a series of paintings or pictures on a wall in this old Elizabethan manor house that had been sealed up behind oak panelling for centuries and when renovations to the building were taking place they found these pictures that evidently had the clues to lead to where this green stone was hidden. Now okay that's all in the book The Green Stone it can also be read in Andy's book The Seventh Sword. Um, but the bit I want to tell you about is one or two of the weird and wonderful things that took place to help us find this green stone when we were running into a bit of a brick wall trying to decode these paintings. Firstly, a number of people that were kind of on the periphery of being involved in this search started having identical dreams or very similar dreams. One particular guy said that he dreamt about a green stone that he thought we were looking for. He had no idea that we were looking for something called the green stone or the mere Nia stone to give it its real name. He had no idea at all but he had this dream and he came and said why am I dreaming about a green stone? A guy called Adam Beard. A girl who lived in North Wales who was only about 12 at the time whose mother was interested in UFOs she had a dream about the fact that we were looking for a stone as well. I'm not quite sure if she said a green stone, but she said it's to be found in a casket, a brass casket, and she actually drew a picture of what it was like. And another person involved in this, a guy called Terry, had a similar dream at the same time. These people were completely unknown to one another, about a brass casket that contains something of great importance and when you compare their two drawings together they looked very similar. So myself and Andy started following this trail of clues and eventually it led us to this bridge in the Worcestershire countryside where another clue was eventually found but we thought we were looking for this green stone at this point but just before we set off are to go to this bridge, we were told this Alan Beard, the guy who'd first dreamt of the green stone, phoned us up and said, hey, you're not looking for a stone at this point, but a sword that will lead you to the stone. Now, if I remember rightly, Gaynor, this is the young girl who was only about 12 at the time, all, had almost exactly the same dream or vision that we were looking for a sword at this point that would eventually lead us to the stone. And we thought, wow, this is amazing. I mean, you know, these two people separated by hundreds of miles. They didn't have the internet and stuff like that in those days. And this guy was like a middle-aged man who knew no, none of the rest of the people. And this is a 12-year-old girl having this same dream that we're supposed to be looking for a sword. And then Marion, who was Gaynor's mother, who told us about Gaynor's dream, said, what you're looking for, when you find it, there'll be a holly bush there. 
And she said there's also this terrible, weird smell of rotting vegetation. When you get like to that place, you have found what you're looking for, and Gaynor thinks you're looking for a sword. And cutting a very long story short, we were so keen in those days, we set off there, it was like the middle of the night, we ended up at this bridge that was on private ground, but that's another story. We ended up at this bridge and we, we were immediately hit by this overpowering rotting smell of vegetation because obviously the river had got bunged up there that went under the bridge and what had happened was that all these leaves had rotted away and we kind of knew we must be in the right area and right there, right where we eventually worked out according to these clues and these uh, paintings where we were going to dig, there was a holly bush right on top of it, a solitary holly bush right there next to it. So, ha you know, these people were picking up psychic impressions, is all I can call it, separated by miles, helping us to find what we were looking for by following a secret series of historical clues. And cutting a long story short, we eventually pulled the relevant stone out of the foundations of this bridge which we'd worked out from all these clues and behind it, completely encrusted in years of silt and sediment, was this short sword or long dagger, exactly as people had told us. And of course this thing was clean, I mean that was, as far as I know, Andy and I were the first people to ever find buried treasure by following psychic messages. So we got the whole series of clues that had been in these paintings left there for hundreds of years and a group of people getting psychic messages that led us to find this artifact. And I think to be quite, I mean this is, we, this is before the Holy Blood Holy Grail was written, it was years before Dan Brown, it was before Indiana Jones and I'm telling you, you may not believe me, but if it wasn't for us doing that, a lot of these other people would not have been inspired to write these things that eventually led certainly to Dan Brown's books, possibly to even to things like Indiana Jones. So when on my website I describe myself as a real life Indiana Jones, and people say, oh, well, he's just copying Dan Brown. No, he is not. <laughs> so if you don't forget anything else, when you leave here, remember this. Dan Brown did not start it off. Me and him did. <laughs> <He's going back. laughs> so... Anyway, but that's just, that's kind of like how the, the whole thing started. So right from the very beginning, even though I had been using historical research to investigate mysteries, and, and the other two, of course, what, I'm just going to talk about some of the things that happened to me now. Over the years, there have been many times where weird and wonderful things, and n not just so much psychic stuff, but things that, I mean, you can understand people perhaps picking up on history in a dream, or sharing telepathic dreams, or precognition, or clairvoyance, but some of the things I'm going to tell you about now take the whole kind of idea of what Andy calls psychic questing, and I call divination by landscape, to a kind of completely almost quantum level, if you like. For example, in my book, The Templars and the Ark of the Covenant, of which you'll find copies in the foyer, <laughs> I actually go in search of where the Ark might be buried based on a whole series of clues that have been left by the Knights Templars. I won't bore you with the details of that, but one particular clue, this is just one thing that happened, was that we knew we had to find something to do with a star. It had been in a stained glass window, is one of the clues. And myself and Graham and Jody, two friends of mine who were helping me to do the search for this, were driving around Warwickshire in central England, not far from Stratford-upon-Avon, Shakespeare's supposed birthplace. We were driving around looking for something to do with a star, maybe a pub called the Star, which had been called the Star 150 years ago at the time when these, uh, clue, some of these clues were left. And then we were thinking, well, maybe the clues go back to the time of the Knights Templars, many hundreds of years ago. There might be a star maybe on top of a spire, you know, like some sort of um, weather vane. And we were looking around, and we really were running out of options. And they had to go back, they came from America, they had to go back to America the next day. And we thought, well, if we don't 
solve this star mystery. We're gonna, you're going to go back and that's going to be it. We're going to be stuck for ages. Now, another thing that was in this stained glass window was a rooster, a cockerel right next to the star crowing. And that kind of came into the whole clues in another way. But what happened was we were just about to give up we were driving down this road. We didn't think we were anywhere near where we were supposed to be, looking for whatever it was we were looking for at that time. And we just pulled up at the side of the road. Uh, Graham Russell, who was driving, his, the window was down, his win driver window. And we just pulled up, thinking, well, which way are we going to go? And suddenly this, this rooster, cockerel, cried, run outside the window, <laughs> on top of this fence. And literally, Graham, who was driving, it was right in his ear. He almost crashed into the side of the road. He pulled right up on the curb. And it, we were kind of, oh, what an oh, You know, what's this cockerel doing in a, on, on a roadside? You know, what, shouldn't it be locked up in a, wherever they keep them? Where do they keep them? In a pen, a hut, chicken. a chickenry. I don't know. Anyway, but it, there it was, literally by the side of the road. So it cries out and stops us in our tracks. And at that moment, Graham turned around and says, oh my God, because he, he was so shocked that he ended up with his head out the window, staring at a road sign saying, Star Lane. <laughs> and that is, cutting a story, long story short, it was how we eventually ended up finding the next clue. And if it hadn't been for that cockerel crying out, it, we would have never have stopped. And there's a cockerel in this window right next to the star. So that is the kind... Now, I can understand now some people might tune into history and dream about a green stone or dream about a sword being in a bridge or even have an image of what the place would look like with a smell of vegetation and a holly bush. But how does a cockerel know what to do? And what's it doing there anyway, right next to this star sign? And how come it's in a window? I mean... I, can, I could go, I mean, I've got a certain amount of time, but I could give you many, many, many examples of this kind of weird synchronicity that I've had in the time when I've, that have helped me do my research. And I can't work out either. The only ways I can think that how it could work is if we're living in some kind of matrix and reality isn't the way we think it is. I mean, I've been looking into quantum theory and... Things that really have no logical sense in our ordinary conscious mind do take place at a quantum level. But we're talking about minuscule subatomic size when things happen that shouldn't make sense, like things being in two places at one time um, and uh, light being both particles and a wave not both, both at the same time, which makes absolutely no sense to our logical minds. But those kind of things, quantum working, shouldn't take place on a macro level in the world we live in. This world's ruled by the, by the, by the, the, the theories of Newton and Einstein, and it, it doesn't, the quantum physics doesn't work in the big world. But if it did, then you could understand somehow, like some guy paints a picture of a, uh, there's a stained glass window of a cockerel and a star next to it, knowing that some th hundreds of years later, some people are going to be driving in a car down a road, and it's going to be on the side of the road, and there's going to be a road sign next to it. I don't know how it works, but over and over again, these weird synchronicities have occurred. Now, that's an example of some kind of strange coincidence taking place. Um, something we did recently, again, it's a completely different search for another stone. We, I don't know why we keep searching for stones. We've got enough to fill a museum. But quite a lot of, of the artifacts that I have searched for in my life have been things like mystic stones and gems. And, art, and this was another of these stones. Now, we knew that where it was hidden somehow was connected with King Charles II. Now, King Charles II is said to have hidden in an oak tree in near a place called Boscobel House near Wolverhampton in central England. And we knew that the clues would somehow, they were you know, trying to solve a series of cl historical clues that were left. I won't bother you with all those now because it's the mystical weird things I need to talk to you about. 
And these clues basically led us to a tree called the Royal Oak. Now you'll get many pubs around the country called the Royal Oak. They tend to be named after an actual oak tree in which Charles II, is, before he was king, is said to have hidden when Cromwell's men were looking for him after they'd chopped his father's head off. And he hid up this tree and eventually escaped the roundheads who were looking for him, went to France, grew up and later came back to England, become Charles II. So he's Prince Charles at this point. So, he's supposed to hide up, and this oak tree is still there in the grounds of Boscobel House near Wolverhampton. So we go to this tree, and we have no idea what we're looking for, how, why the clue should, to this stone should be associated with this tree. And while we're there, uh, one of the girls is with us, Maya, she says, oh, I'm getting bored of this. I mean, she was like the daughter of the lady that was helping us do the research. She was like 15 or something at the time. She said, oh, I'm getting bored of this, so I want to go somewhere where there's internet. <laughs> so anyway, we end up going to some local nearby um, sort of garden centre place where she could get online. And while we went there, she said, oh, what's around here? So then she took us to this owl sanctuary that was out the back. And we were thinking, oh, and she said, oh, this is really interesting. And she got more interested in the owls than she was in sort of texting her friends or whatever she wanted to do. So after that, we were joking about it, saying, oh, well, finally she's interested in something. So we started calling her Owl Girl. So anyway, we went back to this tree with Owl Girl. <laughs> and um, we thought, well, <laughs> she said, she, she then suddenly said, no, sorry, the next day, she then had a dream about an owl. Now, OK, maybe she would dream about an owl. We'd been to an owl sanctuary. And she then said, when we stood at the tree, she said, I think there's something to do with owls here. Later, we discovered that according to legend, when Charles II hid in this oak tree, what happened was that the roundheads were close behind the, him and they were standing at the bottom of the tree. Somebody heard a noise up in the tree thinking, somebody's hiding up there, and they were about to start firing up into the tree to sort of get, kill whoever was up there, and suddenly an owl flew from the tree. And they said, oh, it's just an owl, and they moved on, and it saved his life. So we thought, wow. She, but it wasn't just, if she had just had a dream about an owl, and then we found out about this. You could say, well, maybe she read about this once or psychically changed into it. But the owl sanctuary, well, that was coincidence, total coincidence. We stopped the search then. It, it took some time later until we eventually ended up in another place. We followed a kind of series of other clues and we ended up in this um, this old grotto, which was in the grounds of a place called Western Park, um, the stately home of the Earls of Bradford and now owned by the National Trust. And there's this um, kind of cave uh, with, and it's a kind of cave, an old hermit's cave supposedly, and it's kind of got brickwork and so forth around the entrance. Now, we ended up there, and Andy was with us at the time and a number of other people, and uh, while we were there, Andy said, because Maya was with us, she said, Maya, you've been getting all these things about um, owls and stuff. Why don't you sit in the cave there and see if you get any dreams or visions or anything? So she said, yeah, OK. Now, at this moment, Andy suddenly said, hey, look at this. Right there was this um, uh, a, 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 a plaque telling us about this little grotto. And the most amazing thing about it was it said, he said, it's all about owls. And what it had said is, according to legend, the owl that flew out of the tree that was in uh, the, the Royal Oak tree, which is like about two or three miles from where we were by this point, was supposed to have flown to this cave where it lived. And it was all on this plaque. We would been, we'd been led to this place completely separately. So the owl comes back into it again. Now, then, Maya has a dream of which she said she said, well, no, has a vision, kind of, if you like, in a mind's eye thing, comes out of the cave and says, well, this just sounds silly. I'm not even going um, to say this because it just sounds ridiculous. 
And she said, she said she had a dream that um, there was a, um, a b <laughs> there was a chicken that had been cooked that had been running along a cooked chicken until it gradually turned back into a real chicken again and then reached this wall across the road, uh, across the, the grass. Well, I just thought that was nuts, but then Andy said, no, no, it makes total sense. What bird comes back from the flames? The phoenix. And it just so happens that right next to this, there was a mausoleum in which we'd found years before a statuette of a phoenix. And he said, that's obviously what it is, it's up there. We've got to look where Maya saw the chicken run. <laughs> the chicken run. <laughs> so we went to this wall and cutting a bit of a story short, in, in amongst the, 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 the cement work around the bricks was cut away and we found the stone. Now, how on earth does that work? But what makes it even weirder, I'm probably coming to the end of my, am I bell going yet? How many minutes? Turn that off. <laughs> Persecute. Um, nine minutes, right, fine. What's even weirder is a few months back, myself and Jody, my friend from America, one of the ones who was in the car when this cockerel crowed and almost scared us to death, she, was, um, she said to me, she said, you know, I've got a feeling that, you know that place you went where you found that stone where that owl was connected with? I said, yeah. She says, I think that's, I've just got a feeling that that has got something to do with the research we were doing. Now, the research we were doing at this point was connected with Roman Britain. And we were looking for a shrine that was connected with a goddess worshipped by the Romans. We didn't exactly know which one it was. And she said, I think that that place could be something to do with it. And I said, well, no, there's no way, because that is just some kind of, like, couple of hundred-year-old folly. She said, well, then how come it's associated with Charles II and this owl? I said, well, probably that's a later legend, or there might have been something there in Charles II's time, but that's the mid-1600s. We're not talking about some ancient Roman structure. And at that moment, we said, Let, well, let's go online. I'm talking to her. She's in the States. I'm talking to her on... on, on, um, on Skype and said let's go online let's have a look so I thought okay let's go online and have a look about that place see what there is this is a few months couple of few months ago the moment we typed up Western Park and this folly what we thought it was it said that an archaeological dig was starting there that very day <laughs> one hour away from the time we're looking at it I'm thinking what the what there's never been an archaeological dig there before. It was going to be open to the public for a week long. It was being sponsored as part of some fundraising thing. And I thought, wow, I'll go there. So I went back to this, what we now call the Owl um, Grotto, turned up there. These archaeologists are digging away. Basically, they say after a couple of days, they said, uh, I said, so this is just what, a kind of uh, 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 sort of 16, 1700s folly? We thought that, but no, it is built over a much earlier shrine that appears to have been a holy well, and before that, because of parts of the statues we have found, it was a shrine in the Roman times to Minerva, who was represented by an owl. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how does this work? I mean, clearly that you've got, maybe the Romans thought Minerva was associated with that, they have an owl, how is all this kept in the unconscious? Maybe somebody later associates an owl with the thing and then, and then Charles the sex. I mean, by the time you try to put all this stuff together, you lose track. So you can't really put it in a test tube and say, this is how you test for it. This is why all these psychic type, uh, psychic investigators and paranormal research groups are saying, oh, well, there's no repeatability in this kind of stuff. No, there isn't. But you can use this stuff to help you, and I do. And the next book that I'm bringing out, I'm including a lot of this stuff in it uh, about actually how some of these weird coincidences and synchronicities have actually sort of helped me to, to find things. And in fact, one of the books, as I was talking about, The Templars of the Ark of the Covenant, I do actually include some of the weird things that are happening there as a kind of taster just to see if, how people will take it. But I think, just as I said, on a closing note, um, I might, 
exp explain some of the even weirder things that can sometimes happen. There goes the bell, so you've got five minutes. Now, I've got a number of things down there. I'm sorry I haven't got time to talk about them, but um, okay. Here's one, <laughs> here's one that's a bit funny, right? There's a book called The Eye of Fire I did years and years ago, and it all involved this ghost, if you like, of a Victorian black magician called John Newton Langley. People he was first seen opposite the house that myself and Andy used to use as a headquarters for a magazine we used to run called Strange Phenomena. This is back in 1979. This, firstly, pe people were saying that they'd seen the, what they appeared to be a ghost of a, to a guy in a top hat and a long coat Victorian style standing outside the Victor, the place that we lived. Later, uh, somebody came up with the name John Langley somewhere. Much later, when we actually did research, we found that the house opposite where we lived is where a man called John Langley did live in Victorian times. Okay, ghost, psychic message, somebody picks up John Langley. Great. But then, this John Langley, who at first we thought was probably maybe haunting us for some reason, it turns out that John Langley, this ghost, this dark figure in a top hat, people start seeing him everywhere. Now, many, uh, 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 some years later, Caroline got involved in our research, and this figure in his top hat, who was supposed to haunt a road in Wolverhampton, turned up out outside her house in South London, in the middle of a busy square, outside this pub, looking up at the window. Of course, we went rushed down there, there was nobody there, but he started to appear all over the place. On one occasion, he appeared on top of a hill, gave us a clue, if you like, to where we were looking for by kind of by standing next to this tower and we all rushed up there, there was nobody there, we rushed back down the hill, back he was again. It, but he looked solid, I even took a photograph of this character. He's solid, it's in the book, The Eye of Fire. I think there was a copy on sale outside, these books go for a fortune now on account of the fact it's been out of print for years. But um, I haven't even got one myself, but if you never get the book The Eye of Fire online somewhere, you'll, or, or you'll see a photograph of this guy in this top hat, who, well, he looks human, but he kept disappearing. But when I was going to say what is really weird and how on earth this can happen, we've got this ghost following us around, this ghost that sort of like helps us in some strange way. But you explain this. What happened was that we then discovered that John Newton Langley was associated with the person that actually owned the house that we were using as the headquarters of the magazine that we were running at the time. Now, when we t I took that place on originally just as a flat to live in. Somebody just suggested, oh, you won't want to live there. How come we ended up being in a place that was associated with this Victorian black magician who turned out to be the head at one point, or the second, or the second in charge, of the order of Meaniah, the people that had once possessed this green stone in earlier times. And we, how? How do we end up in a place, but totally by coincidence, that is tied up with the very research that we're doing? I mean, what I'm trying to say is that there are far, far weirder things that go on out there than any scientist or paranormal researcher will look into. And these things can help you to, to, to solve clues and basically to do research. And I, as, I, as I say, I call it divination by landscape. And one final thing is, do you know if you get the tarot pack and you do get a card and it tells you something and by the imagery on it you get some good idea? Well, we do this divination by pub. <laughs> We've been into pubs. I've sat there with Graham and Jody in one pub once, my friends that were helping me with the art research, and we said, we have no idea where to go next. Somebody tell us. I remember Graham turned around to me and he said, well, okay, the next person through that door who comes in the door will give us the clue as to where we have to go. And it just so happened that somebody came through that door dressed as a jester. 
it was for some party they were going to, and there was other people dressed in different ways. This girl, who was dressed as a jester, had clearly decided to dress as a jester weeks before. She'd have to go out and buy the costume. She didn't mysteriously appear there with it on the moment we wanted someone to come through the door that gave us a clue. And it just so happened that the thing that we were looking for, we realised, was at the jester's arms. And that brought about um, a whole new set of things to do with something called the Fool. Uh, the Mr. Punch, if you like. Uh, but I won't even bother to go into that. But anyway, so I've given you some examples of some of the weird, crazy things that we use in questing or divination by landscape. And I'm sure Andy now is going to explain exactly how it works. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh...